He's counting every one of my steps. Why? Because we matter, because we make that much of a difference. So we are in the middle of chapter 42, and we are discussing the concept of God's awareness of us as an expression of awareness of self. And we explained, and these are very deep concepts that the Alter Rebbe is like trying to really bring down that we can intellectually grasp God. Now, the point is, you can't intellectually grasp God. That's an oxymoron. I'm finite. My brain is finite. The most brilliant human being's brain is finite. And God is infinite. So one could say this is a, a preposterous objective. This is a ridiculous target. Facts. As the verses say, if you're going to investigate God, you're going to find verse after verse after verse that expresses this point. He's creator. We're creation. You're never going to get me. True. But we have a mandate to try because we also have a command. This is what God wants. This is a tool of connection to him. Know the God of your fathers. So we're supposed to understand God as much as the human mind can comprehend, knowing that our human mind is limited and we will all reach a point where we don't get it. And that's fine. And at that point, we ascend to an even higher belief. But until we get to that point, we try to stretch. So the Alter Rebbe here is trying to take these concepts of God and really make them digestible to the human brain. That is really the whole, if I could say, specialty forte of Tanya is to take God in his depth, in his incomprehensible depth, and make it something the human mind can fathom. So God's relationship to us, God's understanding of us, God's awareness of us. And we were saying, and this is the basic premise that we're discussing in this chapter, that God is intimately aware of everything, of every aspect of every dimension of every cell every molecule of all of creation not just the physical creations of all the spiritual creations myriads and myriads and myriads of creations he's intimately aware of how how because it's all an awareness of self and the rebbe said to understand this to try to make our minds understand the non-comprehensible that just as we feel everything going on in our body at this moment, we said, if you had a, a pain in your toe, pain in your toenail, you would feel it. Of course you would feel it. You might do things to distract yourself or you might be so busy you don't pay attention to it. But if you chose to, you would feel it excruciatingly in all its details. Why? Because it's a part of me. Well, that's the relationship of God to all of creation. All of creation is him. So he is aware of every aspect of every creation on all the spiritual planes and on all the physical dimensions, because it's all him. So that we got, hopefully, made sense to us, hopefully. There was no dissenting voices. Nobody questioned anything. And now what we're up to is the Rebbe saying, but hold on, now that I made it so comprehensible, now that I squashed God into your brains, I don't want you to think that's it, because it's not. It's not like, oh, okay, now I understand him, or at least I understand this dimension of him. No, 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 you still don't. Why not? Because if we're comparing God's awareness of creation to our awareness of self, there's a discrepancy, a very significant discrepancy, which is that in our reality, the I of the person, if you do it the persona of the person, if you do it the soul of the person, is affected by body. I was talking with someone from this class at a certain point in the week, and, and she said it was sort of surprising for her to, to learn that concept. Of course, we understand how the soul impacts the body, but it was sort of a, a novel twist to think of the body impacting the soul. But of course it does. If we think about it. Of course, if my body is, you know, like our sages say, uh, 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 a small hole in the body could be a great hole in the soul. Because if the body is weak, is deprived, is malnourished, is cold, is hot, is exhausted, all these are physical things. Nothing to do with your soul, right? No, wrong. Because in all of these conditions, your soul will be affected and your soul's abilities will be lessened because of the stresses and constraints and weaknesses of the body that the soul is expressing herself through. So it's not like the soul got weak, but in a sense, it is like the soul got weak because as the body weakens, it's harder and harder to, to, to express the soul through the body. So that means in a sense, the soul is also getting weak. The soul is definitely getting affected, impacted by the weaknesses, the limitations of that body. And that is not true for God. Even though God's awareness of creation is like our awareness of self, creation doesn't limit and hamper and harness and change God like our body can do to us. So I did have this this woman shared with me how that really impacted her and affected her. Anyone else had any reflections on any of these ideas over the week? It's fine if you could say you weren't thinking about Tanya over the week. That's, that's legit too. Anyone have anything that they were thinking of from these ideas? 
Would you say that the um, that the soul is extremely impacted by the body? If body is really, really invested in, in physicality, that the soul is, is affected in that way? So you're saying if the soul, if the body, the body. is like, like you're saying, very indulgent, there's yes. a lot of indulgences in the body, would this hamper the soul? It would definitely hamper the soul's ability to express itself on the body, which in a sense then is hampering the soul. Because what is the soul in our body for? To connect to God. All our soul wants is God. That's it. She wants God. The way she gets God is through us. The core of us is our soul. And that's all I, the real I, all I really want is my relationship with God. I get distracted and confused, but that's what I want. The soul's not distracted or confused. That's what she wants. She wants every thought you think, every word you say, every feeling you have, every action you do, she wants it to be God. So imagine if that soul is stuck in a body that's immersing itself in the pleasures of this world, like almost deafening herself to the sounds, to the voices of God in the world, because she's so in immersing herself in the pleasures of the world. For sure, that's affecting the soul, because that's in essence, almost like preventing the soul from what she wants to do, what she's here to do. So it's a tremendous limitation on the soul. It's not like the soul is not affected. Of course, the soul is affected. Absolutely. Absolutely. And imagine how much joy your soul has when you're learning Tanya, when you're davening, when you're praying, when you're giving charity, when you're loving another Jew, when you're thinking about God. Imagine. As, as Alta Rebbe says in Tanya, she's free. She's like the prince in prison. And for those moments, she's free. She's back home. She's with her father, with the king, in the palace. And then when you stop, she gets stuck right back in the prison. It's, it's very, it is very pointed. And there's a lot of Tanya that discusses this point and says, wait a minute, I'm the prison? <laughs> My body is the prison? And the answer is, yeah, absolutely, 100%. So we want to, we want our bodies to be facilitators for our soul, not prisons for our soul. Absolutely. Anyone else, any other thoughts or reflections on this? Okay. Can I, I I just was going to ask, like, I see as I'm getting older, I get slower and, um, you know, the body, uh, isn't, uh, it, it's, it's great, but it's, you know, it, it has certain deficits from all the years, you know, and how is that like taken into consideration? I don't think that's harming your soul's ability to express itself. I think it'd actually even be the opposite that maybe if your body, you know, so to speak, takes up less space, your soul can have more. It's actually interesting. The second Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Mittler Rebbe writes, this very fascinating thought, which I think as one ages, it's something to really think about. As many of us might know, it says there are three partners in the creation of a, of a, of a human, the father, the mother, and God three partners. I always remind God of this all the time. I'm like, you know, <laughs> you pull your weight in the partnership. I'm doing mine for the kids, but you got to pull your weight. I'm dumping a lot on your, your, your end of the deal. So that's, that's true. We know this fact. It's true inside each one of us, but the middle Rebbe adds something fascinating that maybe you don't know. He said that in the younger years of a person in the youthful years, the father's element is most dominant. In the middle years of a person's life, the mother's element is most dominant. And in the older years of a person's life, the God piece is most dominant. That's beautiful. It is. What's young, what's old? So I, I can only say this is what's written. And I did have actually interesting, I was sharing this uh, in, in, in the class I give in the CMC, I was, speaking to them about this concept of, you know, you are in your, your, your peak of connecting to God. And then someone asked a very interesting question. She said, well, what if, what if someone passes away young? Like, does it get split in thirds that way? And I was like, that's a great question. I don't know the answer, but I went back to look at the text to see exactly how the Mithla Rebbe wrote it. And based on that, that I came back and I said, no, I don't believe so. Cause he does write your, your, your elder years, not the last third of your life, he writes your older years. So, I mean, I don't know. He doesn't give numbers. If we're going to say, I don't know. We, we can think of it in terms of a person. 
you know, how long is it that our passions and our lusts and our physical energies are the most dominant? That's the father piece. And then as they subside more and the other pieces of us, the more refined pieces take over, that's the mother piece. And as we age, it's the part when we're most easily connecting to God, because that's the God piece. That's Can how the Mitzvah Rebbe explains it. Why is father before mother? I don't know why. I could hypothesize, but I can only know what's written. And he writes the father and then the mother and then God. And therefore, as he's writing, this is all what he's writing. That's why in a person's youth, their animal drive is the strongest. Their drive for physical pleasures is the strongest because men are, are more physically oriented than women. And then in the second stage of one's life, those physical drives subside, that pushing for just the physical pleasure subsides because the mother piece takes over and women, but again, obviously there are exceptions to the rule and men are the exceptions to the rule and women, but we're talking overarching, women's generally have more of a, less, less of a push that of, for the physical. And that's why in general in humans, as we age and the mother piece takes over, that gets less. Then he writes and, and in the elder years, it doesn't give an age, but then I, I don't know if we'd say the cutoff now is 65, you know, 60, 65, whatever, you know, we're designing in America, but in those elder years, the God piece is most dominant. And that's why in those years, so I'm saying this in response to, to Sarah's point, that I would think as maybe the strength of the body subsides in a certain way, it seems like based on what the Mithla Rebbe is writing, it allows more and more room for the expression of the soul. So that's an interesting point. We're not there talking about maybe um, deprivation of the body, which would hamper the soul, but a lessening of the intensity of body and giving more space for the soul to shine through. So we should know as, as we age, just gets better and better. And it should be more and more and more natural to connect to God. That is the middle of point. To be what more is the more mother component showing? Where or how? How do we see the mother component? The middle of is saying when the physical passions subside, that's because the mother energy is taking over, which again does not, he's not specifically relating it that we think of, well, my father, well, my mother, He's saying basically male energy and female energy. And he's viewing male energy as more physically oriented and female energy as <clears throat> less physically oriented. Now, again, you could say, oh, but it says in Hasidus, the, the forefathers, the matriarchs versus the patriarchs. There's many, many dimensions to everything. But from this perspective, as the Mithla Rebbe is explaining it, men have a more natural, strong drive for the physical and women can be more remote from it, can be more detached from it. And that's why we're putting the younger years when the, the father's energy is the strongest one as the most physical. And then as the mother's energy takes over less physical, but again, it's not a reflection on a fa the, per your personal father or mother. It's the general male and female energies. Any other thoughts you see, sir, you got us in trouble here. Any other thoughts? Okay. So we're going to looking inside. Now this is a point we're developing, right? So we want to understand this idea to remember what we were saying that on one hand, as we understand ourselves, we can reflect on God. And as I feel everything, my body feels. God feels and experiences and knows and is aware of everything on every single level of creation. It's all him. But we said, I, the persona, the soul is affected by the afflictions of the body. And God is not changed by the changes that happen to creation. So we are on page 120, two, four, six, eight, nine lines from the top, third word. So in order to understand all this very well in our brain, like we just said it, but what are we really saying? Because the Alter Rebbe's goal, again, this is the goal of Tanya, for us to understand the ununderstandable, for us to comprehend what's non-comprehensible. 
So the Rebbe said it, and he said it metaphorically, so we should be able to translate and digest that metaphor to God, but to really understand this better. The sages of truth, which is a term we use for the masters of Kabbalah, they've spoken at length about this point in all their works, which means there's a lot written on this. There's a lot of ink spent to help us grasp God, especially in the Kabbalistic dimension. Ah, but kol Yisrael ma'aminim b'nei ma'aminim. Jews are believers. You're a Jew, you're a believer. If I'm speaking to someone and they say they don't believe in God, you're Jewish. Your mother was Jewish. You're a Jew. You believe. You might have been trained to not trust that voice. You might have been trained to doubt it. But deep in you, you can't escape yourself. You can't escape your core. No atheist in a foxhole. Every single Jew is a believer. Every Jew has a far deeper connection to God than mankind, even though every human being believes in God. Every Jew has an innate relationship of sight that our soul, our mazel, our spiritual component sees God reality, seeing is believing. So the belief, the impact, the internalization of a Jew toward God is far deeper than the more encompassing levels that all mankind have. But all mankind believes, and every Jew believes on a much more intimate level. And therefore, the Alter Rebbe is saying here, we're talking, we're trying to comprehend what can't be comprehended, but we're trying anyway. And then we come to a point that we don't understand. And that's appropriate, because how could we? And we know that every single Jew is endowed with enormous natural belief and far deeper than the whole world. And the whole world believes. The whole world believes. And yet Jews are believers, the sons of believers. Because our relationship to God is far deeper, far more intimate than the world's. So for sure, for a Jew, at the point where your mind does not comprehend, we ascend to an even deeper belief in God. As we're saying, ma'aminim, b'nei ma'aminim, believers, the children of believers. And obviously that idea of being not only believers ourselves, but coming from a long line of believers, a line that stretches back to Abraham and Sarah, a golden chain. And again, you can say, oh, I don't know, I don't know about my parents, I don't know about my grandparents, okay. You're alive today and you know you're a Jew. You come from a long line of believers. It's the only way. A long line of believers. A long line of martyrs, a long line of miracles. That's how we're alive today. And there's 15 million people in the world that know there's Jewish. I'm sure there's far more that don't. But there's 15 million Jews in the world that know they're Jewish. That means a long line of martyrs and miracles and believers that they chose. They chose to stick with God, even when it didn't work. It's actually very interesting. <laughs> My son is uh, visiting us. Um, he's doing shlichus in Playa, Mexico. And he said, a little vignette, said that there was a, a, you know, a, a Jew in Mexico who was connecting to God. And he said, like, as he took each step of getting closer, another piece of his life like fell apart. <laughs> he took on this commandment and then this went wrong. He took on this commandment and this went wrong. And the emissary, the shliach in Playa, where my son is, said to him like, it's amazing you're still sticking with God. I mean, like as you grow, like it's supposed to get better in your case, whatever. This Jew responded, and I don't have Spanish, so I, my son, of course, said in the Spanish, which sounded better. It was like two Spanish words, but like basically he said, no choice. No choice. What choice do I have, you know? At this point in my life, when I get it, I'm in touch with my belief. I'm in touch with the reality. Of course, we want that as we do, things naturally flourish, and God willing, I'm sure they will, because that's how the system works. But if for whatever reason, whatever test, whatever thing he has to go through, whatever difficulty, that as he's doing more, he's not seeing things get better. It's the opposite. He says, so what, like, what choice do I have? I, 
I know I'm a Jew. I know this is what God wants. I, I just, I just have to, I just have to keep connecting to God. And in essence, that's the story of every Jew. So as the Rebbe says, what does it mean by meaning, by name, by meaning, believers, the sons of believers? Belishum chakirus seichel anushi. Without using our human mind to investigate and inquire and be speculative and be analytical and critical and... No. We all have an innate relationship to God that is not coming from our minds. It's coming from our soul. The Oimrim. And every Jew says, the Jews that have studied Tanya, the Jews that have studied Kabbalistic works, the Jews that don't know anything. You, God, are the same God before creation and the same God since creation. Now, we can say, perhaps, if you remember chapter 20, now that we're in chapter 42, oh yeah, it's because, and I know, and I could give a, a metaphor, and I could give a story, and I could explain it, and I could... I can make beautiful, beautiful, beautiful words of Torah from this concept. True. But there are many Jews that don't know any of that. But they still believe in God. So the Rebbe is saying, we're stretching our minds, and we're supposed to, and we're trying to comprehend, and we're supposed to. And the Rebbe is giving us metaphors, parables for us to get it, and that's helping. And when we, each one of us reaches a point to feel, I can say the words, but I don't really get what I'm talking about. That's fine too. We have the obligation to stretch our mind as far as we can. And then we ascend to a very deep belief. And I say ascend because it's not a belief that's less than my intellectual development in my relationship to God. It's a belief that's higher. It's a belief that's saying, I use this tool called mind and mind is finite, but I used it as far as I could. And once I got to the max, now I'm going the next step. Now I'm going to a higher stage. Now I'm going to a limitless stage because it's not coming from mind. This comes now from soul. And the core of our soul is the core of God. It's limitless. So on the level of soul, I'm connecting and believing, each one of us believing at that point where our minds don't get it. And we will all come to those points where, where our minds don't get it. Every single Jew, every single person. Whoever he is. If he takes the time every day, a long stretch of time, which as we discussed in the beginning of this chapter, long stretch of time is different for each person because we all have different amounts of time it takes to get to the point of feeling, but we take the time it takes every day. How God fills all the spiritual worlds and this physical reality. And as he literally fills the heavens and the earth, literally the whole world is expressing the glory of God, containing the glory of God. And God, who fills all, who encompasses all, who is all, and all is Him, what is God doing? He's looking, umabit, He's staring, He's looking intently. He's analyzing, He's ascertaining what's going on in your inwards, what's going on in your heart. The whole Maisa Vidiburav, every action you do, every word you say, the Cholta Adav Yispar, every step you take, God is counting. We're that important. We're that influential. You know, we have social media influencers. Every one of us is an influencer. Every one of us is that significant and powerful that God is analyzing every single breath we take and thought we think and feeling we have every single one because we're that significant, we're that powerful. As I tikva belibo, then it will be fixed in your heart. Hayira, that awe, the whole hayom kulo for the entire day. And then as the Rebbe is going to say, and if it leaves you, just quickly, 
fleetingly remind yourself of the concepts, it'll come right back. So what did the Rebbe do here? The Rebbe is saying, we started off by trying to understand. Because he said, look, God, he's aware and he's looking at me and he's looking at me and he's aware. And I'm like, really? How can he be so aware of me? There's a lot of stuff going on in, in, in his world. There's a lot of stuff going on in Chicago. There's a lot of stuff going on in Illinois. There's a lot of stuff going on in America. There's a lot of stuff going on in the world. And then there's all the other planets in the Milky Way. And then there's the myriads of spiritual realities. And God is so focused on me. Come on. And we said, no, he really is. What's going on? How could he be so, so, so aware of me? Like, I'm that important? We said, you're him. He's aware of you the same way he's aware of all of creation because it's all him. And then we said, but by the way, don't think you change him like you, your body changes you, your soul. And then we said, well, this might be a bit past our pay grade. This might be a little hard for us to comprehend, but fear not. You're a Jew. Every human believes, but you're having an even deeper relationship to God. So if the intellectual understanding work, that's beautiful. Go with it. And where it doesn't work, that's beautiful. Believe. And on either level, if you're coming from intellect, if you're coming from belief, from soul, we can all get this. You can do both simultaneously. There's this huge, powerful creator of all, ultimate being of all, and he's fixated on me. He wants me. He needs me. He's relying on me. He's making himself vulnerable for me. And he's analyzing everything I do and think and feel and say. He's counting every one of my steps. Why? Because we matter. Because we make that much of a difference. I'm sure we've all sometimes had experiences. I know I definitely have had where something very small happens and we clearly see God's hand. And we're like, God, to this degree? Like, you're God and you're watching everything, but like really to this degree on something that, that, that that's not even so important. I mean, in the scheme of things, even the scheme of me, where I'm like a small person, so obviously my little things are important to me. But even to me, I'd t- call this a small thing, but you care that much? Like every, has, has, besides me, anyone else has had this experience? Or something happened and they were really aware of the hand of God, but it was in a very small aspect of their life. It was almost like, why did you bother? You cared. Anyone else had that experience? Say, yeah, Lisa has had that. You can raise your virtual hand. You can open your mouths and talk. Anyone else has had that besides me and Lisa? It was just me and Lisa and Sarah. I don't know. <laughs> I, I trust more people. Maybe you're just not thinking of it at this moment. But it's such a sense of like, really? To that degree? That area of my life that I will call little, I still see your fingerprints all over it? And the answer is yes. Absolutely. God cares. Every aspect of you is important to him. God's looking. He's watching. He's with you. He's taking care. He's observing everything. So the Rebbe says this idea, every one of us can comprehend. We can comprehend it intellectually. And we can comprehend it through our belief in God. Meaning, on one hand, it's not a a hard mind-bending concept, but even deeper, we can comprehend it, so to speak, with our soul, with the belief that we all have. So we can really feel what this concept is saying. And when we think about it, the Rebbe says every day, that's a day full of awareness of God. All day, you can feed off your awareness of God by the time you spend in the morning really thinking deeply into these very basic foundational concepts. And as I was going to say, if it fades at some point, just like dip back into the thought and everything you developed in the morning will come out. And your whole day is going to be completely different because you're going to feel God's presence. You're going to feel your awe of God, your respect of God, your relationship with God. And your whole day is going to be different because you're going to be constantly aware of his watchful attention to you, to you helping you, to you needing you, noticing you, looking at you, wanting you to serve him, to connect to him, to change the world, to bring Mashiach. God's made himself very vulnerable to us. And we think about it, 
And how long do you need to think? As long as it takes. For some of us, it's not going to take long. For some, in the beginning, it will take long. It's like everything else. Your mind's a muscle. Your heart's a muscle. All every part of you is a muscle. Your muscles get better as you use them more and more and more. So the more we do this on a regular basis, every single day, the more facile and facile that muscle becomes. And it's more and more natural just flies in that direction of an awareness of God's presence. Now I'd imagine for everyone here, as you study the Tanya, when we're really discussing God and us and our relationship and our, our awareness of self as a piece of God, it should be very natural to think these thoughts and very natural to have the click of the feeling of the emotions of the relationship. And then if at any point in the day you notice it's fading, you already exercised that muscle today, so it's very natural for it to express itself again. So we said that you're going to feel this all day long. And you could say, I don't know, me all day long. Yeah, I thought about it in the morning, but now it's already two in the afternoon. It's already nine in the evening. I mean, it's been a long time and I got a little distracted. I mean, I could get distracted in like five seconds or less, right? So uh, hours later, I'm still going to be in that space that I did create for myself in the morning. But if you just rethink about it for a little bit, I feel as fine as Kala. We don't mean like another deep session. No, very quickly. You just go into that mental, emotional, spiritual space. The whole ace of a whole shot. Anytime, any moment, just jump in. It will be natural. You're going to so feel what you developed in the morning. You will naturally stay away from all evil. You will naturally be clinging to God and to do everything he wants. In all your thoughts, in all your speech, in all your actions. God forbid you wouldn't want to do anything to rebel against God who's, who's watching you, who's aware, who needs you, who's focusing on you. God fills all the world and he's looking at me. And I'm aware of this. And I'm not going to serve him. And like the saying that we mentioned before of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai to his students. So Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai was one of the greatest sages the Jews ever had. We credit him for saving the line of David, which ultimately the line of the, rede of the Redeemer, the Messianic line, saving Torah. He, it's a whole story how he came to the Roman general and actually told him that he's going to be the Caesar. And then minutes later, he got a message from Rome that he was proclaimed the Caesar. So he's like, whoa, what can I do for you? And Rebbe Chaim Zakai asked for three things. One thing that was relatively small to sort of make it seem like his other requests were also not so big. <laughs> that doctor should heal Rav Tzadok, who had fasted for years and years and years to prevent, to forestall the destruction of the temple, to preserve the line of King David, very significant, and to save, he knew he couldn't ask to save Jerusalem because he knew that he wouldn't get, so he very wisely asked to save another city which was full of Torah scholars, Yavna and her sages. Vespasian was so awed by what just happened, this person proclaimed you the Caesar of Rome, like what, 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 what rebellious heresy. And then minutes later, you get the royal message that you are the Caesar of the Rome. He gave into everything. So this was Rabbi Yochanan Zakkai. And here he is on his deathbed. And his students said, bless us, our teacher, uh, savior of the Jewish people. Bless us, tell us, guide us. What can you tell us? What are your last words? And he said, let your fear of God be like your fear of man. And they're like, what? That's what and he said yeah because if you know man's watching you're going to behave understand god is too even more so which could again seem like ultra simplistic ultra you know simple like 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 nothing on the level of sophistication we would expect from the leader of all jews but it's exactly the message the alta Rebbe is saying here right like just imagine if you're I don't know, with your children somewhere and, and they start misbehaving and you just feel everybody's looking at you. 
you know, you handle it very well, very professionally. Everyone's watching. If you're home and they do the same thing, you might raise your voice. If everyone's watching you, like somehow don't raise your voice. You know what you're supposed to do and you do it. Why? Because everyone's watching. So guess what? Rabbi Yochanan Zakkai says, God is always watching. And the answer is saying, understand the depth of that simple concept. Understand God's all of creation. He fills, he vivifies, he creates, and he's watching you. And when you think about that, you stay connected to God.